and three after lunch we will talk about youth in how uh, children are involved. I thought, uh, even though we have the spotlights, uh, difficult to see you down there, but just to, to break the ice, uh, I thought, uh, if you could uh, help me with three questions. The first, if you don't... Uh, raise your hands and say if you have a problem are things uh, difficult uh, with mental health of uh, ch children and adults and lately yes we all agree that the second question uh, well it has self-criticism uh, element uh, do you think that we grown-ups uh, uh, well uh, the adults in the room make an effort uh, to listen and understand uh, our children. So do we make an effort to understand them? Well, more, more hands. Okay, thank you. The third one. If we had a room full of children and uh, adolescents and ask them, do grown-ups understand you? How many children uh, would have raised the ha their hands? Few, you say. This is a generation gap. Uh, well, it has always existed. We haven't learned anything new. So, Yorgos Moskos, what are you going to talk to us about? Well, first, I need to tell you that I'm very happy that uh, with uh, my group, of partners participate in this initiative and we have this program of youth participation, youth, youth engagement scheme. Well, that uh, is what I wanted to share with you. What we are going to share is uh, just an explanation of why we do that, uh, what we are thinking, and what we have already done. We are at uh, the beginning of our effort, but along with uh, Vasiliki Vatali, the coordinator of uh, the advisory group in Thessaloniki, Modistos Gavalas, facilitator of our group uh, in Thessaloniki, and Despina Sertari, a facilitator from Athens. She is also a facilitator in Athens, as I said earlier. Uh, we are responsible to find a way to listen to what uh, adolescents uh, have to say about this initiative. Uh, well, I take my seat. Can you see me? Yes, you can. I have thought uh, I will give you some dates before I explain what we do. Important dates for humanity, Greece and me. 20 years back, uh, 22 of January 2003, the le Greek legislator de decided that the ombudsman becomes an ombudsman for children's rights in Greece. So an agency becomes responsible to listen to children and act on their behalf. Back then, I was a freelancer cooperating with various uh, ministries, uh, active in RC's NGO, and I uh, was invited uh, to take this post. I benefited from that and I tried to participate in a nationwide effort in cooperation with all services of education, mental health, all those services involved with children in order to see children from a different perspective, to work uh, from up, uh, down to bottom up. 
so we are based in the multi-tool, which uh, is uh, the Child uh, Rights uh, Convention. Uh, in uh, 1992 ra was ratified by our uh, country, which in Article 12 says uh, that, uh, no, let me rephrase, all those who take decisions about children should take into consideration the opinion of uh, the child. Not to do what children want, but before you take a decision, legal one, administrative or care a decision, you need to listen carefully how uh, a child thinks, what it has to say. And the, the Article 12, via this uh, scientific analysis that has been carried out all these years and uh, interpretation, while uh, referring to administrative and legal acts, uh, practically it refers to all moments that grown-ups take decisions about children. And it refers to parents, ministries, all those who design programs for children. So everybody has to hear what children have to say. So we have this youth engagement scheme introduced uh, worldwide. It was that exactly what this uh, scheme, this program tries to do. So before we tell you what we do in uh, uh, Obudsman for Children's Rights, I need to tell you what uh, uh, we have in uh, the, the literature. So we had the opportunity to meet uh, children and adolescents. And since 2009, we have organized groups of uh, adolescents. We use them as uh, consultants, advisors. We ask their opinion on certain issues. And we had some consultation meetings with children and adolescents. So we had uh, their voices uh, heard. Oh, nevertheless, when uh, you have a youth, a youth engagement scheme, you need to be cautious. Richard uh, Hart uh, uh, has already mentioned uh, that uh, in his article. So you need to be very careful. Well, you need uh, to, you need to be careful. Uh, about tokenism, to be careful, to be substantial and, uh, sub uh, and uh, concrete, uh, not just invite them and uh, to tell them, you need uh, to tell you things. You have to invite them again and again. You try to, you, avo you must try to avoid uh, to manipulate them by giving them uh, uh, answers, uh, questions that already provide uh, the answers. And, of course, you should uh, make use of the children and their points of view and not use them as uh, a, a window that you work for them. Uh, uh, you don't use them as a decor, we could say. So when we talk about how you listen to children, you should have some things in mind, some things we have studied, we have seen in practice, and included them in our partners' uh, training and practice. Laura Landry from uh, U the UK, a specialist in uh, participation, if you want to listen to children first, you need to create space for their voices. Not come here and tell me. You need to give them space for their voices. Second, uh, to have uh, a way to allow them to express their voice. To, to uh, a voice is not just verbal. You can express yourself via designs, uh, body language, feelings. So voice... Uh, needs tools. Uh, third, uh, you need uh, someone to listen to children. 
not to talk uh, alone, but uh, there should be there uh, someone who listens to them with uh, uh, full attention. And children need to know that what they say are useful in something, are used in something. So that is our approach. And uh, we want to say to our children, okay, the specialist took into consideration your point of view and used it. Before I rest my case, I would like to add a couple of things uh, we incorporated in our scheme. The first is interaction. You cannot invite a child to, to say without exchanging his points and her points of view with others. So we have interaction among them via interaction. <coughs> Children feel at ease. They feel that they truly participate. And the second step is to be able to articulate their uh, ideas uh, openly and enjoyment is a critical uh, point even though the process might be difficult they should feel happy to combine so we need to combine games uh, with serious discussions because we must never forget we are uh, we have to do with children At uh, school, when we discussed about uh, child abuse and we were serious about that, a child started uh, crying. And uh, I I understood how important for a child is to cry. So, uh, and after a while, uh, another uh, child started crying. Then we stopped, we played a bit, then we came back uh, to uh, some serious stuff. So you need to to include everything when you have to talk to children. So what you have asked, what we have done. When last year I was invited uh, to talk uh, about uh, this program, of Stavros Nyarkos about mental health and children, I felt uh, happy because uh, I uh, thought uh, that uh, it's important uh, to have uh, an institution behind that. Then when I heard about the participants, I said, I trust them. And then I found from my environment people, I, I knew how to invite people, so people who could help me work with children and something very critical to network with uh, teachers, uh, secondary education, uh, teachers uh, of secondary school, uh, because we need them. Of course, what we do is to have uh, groups of adolescents in uh, the towns where we have our hubs. We started with Athena, Thessaloniki, Alexandrupoli, Iraklion. Uh, we have a delay, but it's okay. And in uh, the Peloponnese, there is uh, a, a provision for the Peloponnese as well. So we built a group of adolescents who are chosen after an open call. And you will hear the example of Thessaloniki. In this call, we try to convey the message to a lot of recipients, uh, 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 teachers, uh, people who work in facilities for people with disabilities, minorities, adolescents that want to be part of our Uh, group and we start with the aforementioned uh, tools acquaintance play and uh, relationship building uh, relationships are important when you have uh, children in your team in your group so and uh, 
teachers need to build relationships, of course. We need uh, to also encourage uh, people with teams. After the first day, okay, they were rather hesitant. Then they started saying, why don't we meet every week? Of course, it was not possible because they had other things to do. What we scheduled was uh, meetings once a month plus some actions. That was our model. And we had a pilot uh, project in Stavros Nyarchos here. In June, we had 27 children from different frameworks and schools. They expressed their point of view, which actually was more or less the same with ours, they told us. For example, do things uh, that are enjoyable, that make uh, people and children feel at ease, to be able to talk to each other without your intervention. Besides our meetings, uh, another meeting point is Instagram. People, uh, youngsters, uh, meet uh, through the Instagram. So they told us, uh, uh, make some, uh, organize some visits, uh, introduce new topics, uh, and tackle all our problems. See normality, which has uh, some elements of mental health. So see normality, but also uh, try to see what includes pain people that suffer and uh, be careful when you do that. Uh, children started saying that is uh, the slides from our meeting last uh, June here. So besides what they have told us, then we sat among us, uh, designed, studied, and saw in what way we will be able to Uh, invite to, to call uh, them and spread the message among uh, teachers, known and unknown. And I'm glad that I see a lot of those we have already invited. And uh, we uh, called uh, them um, assistants, to put it this way. Assistants, they will... Uh, e- actually uh, suggest uh, adolescents for our groups, for our uh, focus groups, and then they will be able to create their own groups in uh, schools, in uh, housing facilities, and will be able to give us a feedback uh, in uh, various topics. With the assistants, uh, We built uh, uh, these relationships in in these four uh, groups. We have 80 children participating. We had uh, two meetings. The first one was uh, for acquaintances. In the second one, we chose (coughs) from the topics uh, that were signaled as important uh, in the first meeting, and we chose one. This is from Alexandropolis. We chose a topic which is related to various uh, issues, is stress, anxiety during adolescence, and how do we tackle it? I will give uh, now the floor to my partners, Well, uh, depending on the time we have. Thank you. Well, good afternoon. My name is Vasil Givatali. I'm a psychologist and psychotherapist and coordinate the team of uh, the YES team in Thessaloniki, along with uh, Modestos. Modestos. Uh, Yorgos uh, gave us a very nice uh, context uh, about how we designed uh, the way that we work. I just want to say a few words about what is happening in those uh, adolescent groups. We've already had two meetings. The first one lasted for two days, and I want to uh, convey to you the voice of the children, uh, the young people. 
I think that's the reason we are here uh, today. We were very happy to start. It was an excellent start that we did. And when we welcomed uh, the uh, members of our group, they seem they brought us joy and they brought us inspiration about what we want to do. A few practical things that uh, relate to what we do. Uh, during the selection process, when we had the first requests, it was important for us to start making calls to those uh, children uh, and uh, start developing, building our relationship. It seemed uh, simple, but it was a way to ensure that they would be interested and engaged, uh, especially because we know that children tend to start with many activities and sometimes uh, drop out of uh, a lot of them, but we needed the commitment in our group. And we also needed to have the consent of the parents. We wanted to have them by our side. We want them to be. We wanted to be available for uh, questions, and that's how we started building our relationship. With that, as uh, Jorgo said, without that relationship, without this uh, uh, common space for us to coexist, uh, uh, it wouldn't be possible to do anything. Then, we met at a uh, space uh, that is given to us by Arsis an NGO that has a history of 30 years in Thessaloniki and has always assisted us in such initiatives. And we meet there regularly. It's a, sent, it's a place downtown. It's very accessible and uh, easy for everyone to reach. And we started with very simple goals, but very basic ones as well for any team that wishes to work together and achieve something. The first goal was for us to become acquainted And this is why we dedicated a lot of time into playing games. We rely on experiential uh, learning, and we want to create a group where uh, children learn from uh, one, from each other. We are not there to provide knowledge and get feedback. We want the group to co-create the, the learning process. They, we want them to create the outcome. We want to enhance or empower the children that don't feel um, ready to participate from the start. We want to help children uh, open up. So we dedicated our first group into making everyone feeling comfortable. Our discussions, you see in the pictures as well, we sit in a circle. That's a symbol as well. It's symbolic. Uh, we want to look and listen to everyone. And we want to listen to people even when they are not talking. It's not a line of people. It's a circle. We're going to play. We're going to discuss after the play, after the game. We are going to give the space that everyone is able to ask a question, for example. It is also important during the first meeting to create a contract. It's something that we have worked for in the Saloniki. Uh, but it's also common methodology for everyone, uh, all the cities in Athens, in uh, um, Ioannina, in Alexandrupoli. It would not be possible to work with those young people without uh, establishing a contract with them. Of course, that's not a piece of paper, but we created something where we asked children to tell us what they need Uh, in order to be present, in order to be engaged, to feel safe, and to have a good time. A lot of them mentioned uh, uh, concepts such as love or respect. I don't uh, want to come here and uh, talk about all the things that make me nervous without feeling loved. They wanted to uh, um, a space that is non-judgmental because there's enough of judgment uh, in our society. I believe children were very brave in what they expressed. And after we formed that contract in a participatory fashion, continuing to build on our relationship, we gave the floor to the children. That would be the only way to do it. Uh, we didn't have any theoretical uh, knowledge to present to them. Uh, that was not the main interest, even though they have many questions. And they won't be answered by uh, experts. But it was good to start uh, with letting the children play among themselves in uh, subgroups. And uh, you see different pictures of things that they produce during those uh, sessions. We wanted to hear from the children about uh, five things that they feel good about. We are talking about mental health, not about mental disorder with uh, children. So, or five things uh, that are challenge them, that they find difficult, five problems that uh, youth pe young people are facing, and five ways that they can overcome those. And their answers were truly um, extraordinary. 
And uh, because children bring through our discussions everything that uh, modern methodology has to say. They say that the children say that they feel good when they can feel their uh, freedom, when they can uh, coexist with their peers, when uh, they are rewarded, when they feel self-confident. And when it comes to problems, they were also very brave in what they said, and it showed that they have done a lot of work on that part. They are um, concerned about addiction, uh, internet addiction. They understand that it's a problem. Uh, family problems, uh, anxiety, the fast-paced uh, life, exams, the uh, judgmental society. And that's where we felt that they are already giving us the material for the program. And in their proposals, of course, they talk about um, uh, entertainment uh, actions, the spending time in nature, saying that they need help in order to better know themselves. And uh, for one of them said, that that's the only way to work with any problem. Only if you know yourself, you can do actual work. Another thing that I need to mention, we see that children uh, know what mental health is for them. And what we're missing here is the space to express it and uh, actually see what they express being put to action. Uh, It's important for the children to understand that what they're saying is being used. One of them said that uh, we're not here, we're not talking just to talk. Uh, We know that what we're saying uh, here uh, is going to be useful. So what their children are missing is the space to listen to all those things. And another thing is uh, the help that children are asking for um, to be understood by adults. And... uh, It's true that they, the children come uh, with love, with understanding uh, towards their parents because they know that it's a different generation uh, that perhaps cannot, uh, doesn't have the right tools to understand them. Uh, and the same with the educators. And again, this is all just in our first meetings where we are acquainted with the children. We had not even started the program yet, but uh, still the children brought on all the materials that we needed uh, to move forward. In our second meeting, we uh, talked about uh, anxiety, which is something uh, mentioned by all the children in all the cities. When the children came for the second time and saw that anxiety was the topic that we had selected, they were very happy to see it. They saw that we are co-creating a program. The topic that was selected was the topic that they had put forward. Now, I'm trying to be brief now and tell you that children understand and we are happy uh, that we all of us sit down together to co-create something. And uh, the things that we're basing this are uh, already put in our contract, respect, love, uh, understanding. Uh, we talked about anxiety and, for example, someone said that uh, I'm happy that we're discussing about it because it's um, a taboo. And that child did not speak anymore in that meeting, but uh, the the others in the group uh, did not press him anymore. They surrounded him, though. Uh, they supported uh, him in a different way. So this need to be understood and be respected is something um, that the program is very helpful for. And we're working with the children to prepare for our next meeting together. We're trying to um, listen to new things from them. So to sum up, our meetings have a lot of play in them. There's participation and engagement from everyone in any way and fashion that they can. We uh, we hear from children that they want even more meetings. Understanding is given freely, and that creates a, s- a sense of safety. And the need to learn comes from the proposals from the children, even with actions outside of the frame of the program. This uh, brings on more discussions. The children voice uh, their need to have a voice. And all that is happening in a joyful way, uh, in um, 
way uh, that uh, signals uh, this uh, partnership. So children know that if uh, the space is created and if they believe that what they tell us is going to be used, then they work with us. Am I forgetting something? No. No, no, no. Excellent. Um, before I give uh, the floor to Modestos, let me say something that I forgot before. Uh, in cutting years of my 15 years with the Ombudsman and the experience uh, we had with European groups for consultants, for te- uh, teenagers and adolescents, in 2018, when I left the Ombudsman with a group of people, uh, my partners uh, that I worked with all this time, we created the initiative for Article 12, and uh, volu- uh, which also contributed uh, into the creation of uh, that meeting in June. In 2012, we had a participation, but we participated in international actions. The, in the Global Child Program, we created online uh, games. Modestos is one of the people who worked on that and created an online game, Find Them and Get Them. Uh, it's a game that was used a lot during the pandemic. We kept contact uh, contacts that we had uh, with uh, the ombudsman Elise Dari uh, Elise Dari I, I first met her when she was a high school student uh, and now she's a group uh, she's part of our group and she's working alongside more experienced uh, specialists um, she's what is helping us uh, keep things fresh And now, Modestos is going to explain why we have a facilitator that's uh, younger in this role. I will try to use uh, the microphone. It's working. So, uh, good afternoon. Thank you all for being with us. My name is Modestos Gavalas. I'm a facilitator in Thessaloniki, working with Vasiliki. Before I analyze uh, the role of the facilitator and what exactly it does, because uh, perhaps it's difficult to understand, I want to stress the fact that we have four facilitators in uh, four cities. Nelly works in uh, uh, Athena, and we also have one in Alexandrupoli and in Ioannina. All of the facilitators are uh, below 30 years of age, and that's the goal. Uh, We want children to feel comfortable with us, to feel familiar, because we are... uh, also very young. <coughs> and uh, another thing I wanted to mention before I talk about the role of the facilitator, I think that it is very important, such as experts listen to children and uh, the state listens to experts, it's as important for uh, children to be heard by the parents, their educators, and their peers and friends, so that they also feel that they can express themselves and that their opinions Uh, will mean something. So, in terms of the facilitators, what is a facilitator? It's not uh, the one who books the space or uh, carries the waters or uh, has the keys. The facilitator is someone, well, perhaps that's things that we do, but the main role of the facilitator is to help uh, the program, to assist, facilitate the program, facilitate the groups to function uh, smoothly, uh, harmoniously. And I'm talking about um, the fact that we need to understand groups as uh, uh, something that uh, occurs uh, as as a whole and in part. So as facilitators, we have a dual role on the one hand during the meeting and on the other after the meeting. We try to create um, an atmosphere of uh, comfort, of uh, uh, an atmosphere that will help children express themselves, uh, be heard and uh, respect each other. And how do we do that? Uh, with a group. Uh, We use uh, games and play. We perhaps notice when uh, things are getting uh, really um, heavy, the discussion is heavy and uh, a break is needed. 
we tell a funny story, we change the subject so that it does not become too heavy and we don't want to for children to feel that they are not really being heard. Now, in terms of the children themselves, as facilitators, we try to look at the particular characteristics of each uh, child. Uh, everyone is different. They all have their special uh, things about them. So we try to pay attention to those to see how children react uh, within the group, and we notice them. And I will give you an example from Thessaloniki. Let's say A, uh, child uh, number A. He's um, an, an unaccompanied minor who came from Egypt, does not uh, speak Greek fluently, and find it, uh, finds it difficult to socialize. As facilitators, we pay attention to A. We try to help him understand uh, what's going on. Perhaps we translate for him. <coughs> or perhaps we use uh, our body language to make him feel more comfortable. And at the same time, we try to find, uh, to pinpoint what the A likes more. And we try to include that in our program and in our group so that A can become a full member of the group. On the other side, we have B, um, another uh, person, a girl. She wants, uh, she has expressed uh, her need not to uh, have things that are too quiet or too loud. So we try to find a way that. Uh, the group is never too silent or never too loud. That's what we do as facilitators. Now, outside of the meetings, we try to keep in contact with the children through social media because we know that children actually interact more through that than uh, in real life. So we use uh, Discord as, um, as our means, our social uh, media. And we have those groups in Discord where we keep in touch with children almost on a daily basis. We create those sub themes. Uh, we may be talking uh, about anxiety and listen to children and their experiences with um, anxiety. Perhaps they share with us uh, songs or other things. But at the same time, we have other uh, themes. For example, we have one that is called cookies where everyone says what happened to them during the day, just uh, in a more friendly and uh, light-hearted um, manner. We also have a, a discussion about our meetings. And finally, that's the best, uh, Yorgos let me say it, we have tried to introduce <coughs> the part about play, the gamification, a way to keep uh, children interested and also try to make the entire program more interactive. So every 15 days, we have a contest where we ask children to do some um, art, uh, the art form, something that relates to our program, um, and specifically with anxiety. That's our theme for this year. Perhaps it can be a photograph with um, a caption or a poem related to anxiety or a, uh, a drawing, something where we're focusing on the artistic part. It's something that keeps children interested. Uh, there's a lot of participation and engagement. Uh, children vote uh, to find uh, the, the winner of the contest. And in the end, they get uh, well a reward, uh, which is uh, symbolic again. And it uh, has to do with their project that was voted as the, well, maybe the most attractive one. And this is how we keep our group alive uh, in between meetings. And we also give an incentive uh, to uh, the children to be more playful. Ah. <clears throat> I hope I have uh, made it uh, clear or a little bit more clear what the role of the facilitator is. It's very experiential. You have to go through it to understand it. But anyway, thank you for your attention. Nelly, we've known her since she was uh, quite young. In Athens, we had a lot of uh, children who wanted to be facilitators. So we had a draw. And she won that draw. All four uh, children, uh, people interested, were uh, suitable for this role. 
So Nelly, would you like uh, to link what you do today with your previous experience? Good evening, everyone. Good afternoon. I'm Nelly. I don't want to talk about myself, but I say it's rather touching for me to be here uh, uh, and have a post I used to admire when I was a child. Uh, when I was younger, a teacher told me, would you be interested in participating in this group of children who express uh, their selves and ideas? I, I applied and I won the positions. As an adolescent uh, with problems uh, was uh, a revelation for me. I used to go to a place, uh, talk about things to people who were willing to change things to make my everyday life better. I met uh, other children from different uh, social frameworks, I wouldn't have uh, met them uh, otherwise, with whom I cooperated, we matured together, and uh, we exchanged points of view ideas in order to have uh, a better result. Now, I am uh, the facilitator and I see these children in uh, the position I was in the past and I'm glad. <coughs> Modestos had covered me uh, with regard to the role of facilitators. We are in 25, all of us in uh, Athens all together and uh, we try to, uh, to touch uh, uh, different aspects uh, of children's personalities. We acknowledge that we have children from different frameworks, uh, children with disabilities uh, from institutions, uh, and we try to uh, make everybody speak. Well, I asked her to come here. She didn't want to. Uh, she is rather timid, uh, but she is extraordinary when she is with adolescent. Uh, and I'm glad because uh, we initially uh, placed the seed and we let it grow. And uh, she is an example of that. Uh, do we have a child uh, from this group? Would you like to say something? What do you get from this uh, group? Initially, I need to say that this group is extraordinary. All participants uh, are special. Without them, we, cannot, we couldn't have uh, this uh, group. There is no one uh, supervising us. We feel that we are equal. Uh, amongst equals. Uh, now, we wanted to touch upon stress, anxiety as our main topic uh, because this is what uh, problematizes us uh, most. From uh, 27 uh, in the group, 25 of us thought it was uh, of paramount importance. Uh, a lot of my friends experience that uh, at its uh, even more serious uh, form. That is uh, why we have people self-harming uh, themselves. So we are there to express our points of view. Elde is uh, uh, a girl uh, who came to the first meeting and the second, she's part of the group. Uh, could you share something with us? I'm very glad that I participate in this project. She is a student of Panos. Today I came here just to see you. I don't think I have something else to share with you. Having uh, these children 
as uh, Mr. Modestros uh, uh, said, uh, well, uh, he talked about uh, a poem. Back then, we talked uh, about our national anthem, and uh, we combined that. Uh, so, uh, we, the, the child uh, cites uh, a poem written in Greek, focusing on stress inspired by the Greek anthem. In the 10 minutes uh, remaining for this session, are there any comments, any questions uh, uh, from the audience? Okay. Well, I am one of the assistants. I confirm on my part, uh, because we have these children at school, when uh, uh, this girl came uh, to school, uh, Fre- I asked her, Freda, did you have a good time? Exceptionally. Uh, well, we had fun. And that is what she told me the first time she came back uh, from this group to school. So it is uh, an opportunity for children because after uh, the lockdowns and the pandemic, uh, all these children have uh, a need for an open window to allow them to breathe, to allow them to express themselves. And this is quite important. After the second meeting, she came to tell me we won't do anything else. She was stressed uh, and she wanted to bring uh, back uh, her knowledge to school. Well, we. We tell the children, when you go back to school, don't feel obliged to talk about what we do in this group. Take your time, uh, understand first what we do, and then when you feel comfortable, share that with your peers. Anybody else? Good afternoon, Thelma Melina. I am a psychology student and I want to ask if we can voluntarily participate in this program as facilitators. Thank you very much for your uh, proposal. There is a queue of people, uh, but for the time being in this first phase, we don't have any volunteers, but send your name. I need to tell you that uh, we do cooperate with Stavros Nyarchos. We might find a way to do things together. So send us a message, Be keep in touch, or uh, send a message to the mail you will find on our site, and we will find a way to collaborate in the future. Good afternoon. Georgiade Aspasia. I am a first year uh, psychology student. I start my journey uh, right now. Uh, and I am uh, a volunteer in uh, the Scouts. And I like the way you approach. You use this approach, learning through play. We also use in the Scouts uh, uh, to help uh, children learn. And what you do is admirable because children actually need a space to express themselves. It is like sports. And uh, exactly what we do with uh, the Scouts. Uh, oh, yes, uh, there are models. Uh, uh, working models with adolescents uh, that we don't uh, include in our work. Uh, uh, We need to find ways to make children feel that they belong somewhere. Vasiliki Vatali is uh, a member of uh, the COMPASS uh, team in the Council of Europe, there are tools uh, used uh, 
by them. We have tools we want to exchange and learn from other tools. Something else I did not mention, and I kept it for uh, the end. Uh, here in the panel, we don't have a mental health uh, specialist. No, they're not here, but we do communicate with them on a daily basis. We don't do what we feel like doing, but we always cooperate with them. We ask them, and uh, so, yes, is just uh, one scheme. It involves everyone, and at the end we will be able to say, yes, we've done it. We've made it. My name is uh, Panagiota Katsuli. Uh, well, I am a pensioner. I used to be a psychologist, and I'm interested in education, which is uh, absent. And I love children. I feel that all these actions focus more or less on an elite, uh, mental elite of children and uh, people that can understand that something is wrong and uh, have the mentality to seek uh, help. But what about all these invisible children that do not have uh, Uh, this compassion uh, uh, understanding, uh, they are impulsive, they are aggressive, uh, and we have all these results we see on a daily basis uh, on the news. So how can we approach all these children abused by their parents, and how can we also approach their parents? Throughout my career in the Ministry of Education, all uh, conferences, uh, all uh, programs addressed uh, to the same audience, those who were aware of what is going on, but uh, those who cannot uh, who are not aware of what is happening, how can we approach them? Well, I think assistants and facilitators. Well, this very moment, we cannot answer to all, uh, have an answer for all educational uh, problems. Well, okay, I understand about what you say uh, for uh, the elite, but we do have uh, other children as well. Well, their sample is not representative, but nevertheless, with the uh, teachers, uh, with uh, the healthcare professionals uh, by our side, <coughs> we want to give answers. Uh, it's not easy to find an answer. <coughs> And something that I forgot to mention, it uh, creates a frame because we heard about the difficulties of the children, etc. The group is not a um, support group, a mental uh, support group. Of course, uh, you are going to feel respected, you're going to be heard, you're going to receive support. These are the side effects, the positive side effects. But this is not a support group. And that is understood uh, by the children. It's one of the first things that we told them. It's very clear. It's important to know um, each of us what is their job, what is their role. We are psychologists, but we're not there to support them uh, in this sense. Now, in terms of what we heard, these are important things that you said. I just want to stress the fact that, of course, we're not here to do everything. We believe in multipliers. We believe in um, children that are going to be able to accept uh, the more difficult children in a different way. And these children are going to feel how they were welcomed themselves, and they are going to be able to repeat that in the future. Uh, for example, we asked a very simple question to the children. Uh, 
and they, um, it's clear that they can understand when uh, a teenager and an adolescent is experiencing a great deal of anxiety. And they were uh, asking the question, how do we deal with that? So perhaps uh, we, we cannot change everything, but we are present, we are here, and we are doing our best. And uh, perhaps I sound uh, very romantic, but we believe in those children of tomorrow. We believe in multipliers. Uh, we believe in those children that bring questions and they bring them to the schools and their questions. Um, and uh, to children that uh, do not feel they belong in the elite, but are reaching out to find a way to help themselves, uh, even if their parents can't do it for them. Uh, they are asking to to us to give them, uh, uh, to guide them uh, in uh, getting the help that they need. I think that uh, will be one of the things that we will accomplish and we hope to accomplish. We believe in what we do and we believe in the future of what we do. That's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Mr. Moskos. I want to thank you on behalf of uh, the Stavros Niarchos uh, Foundation. We never considered your participation as a given when we started uh, talking to you. I want to thank you and thank your team and uh, all the educators and uh, the children that work with you. Uh, with those uh, conditions of independence and the support of the child psychologists, a great thank you to you and to the educators at school. Thank you. I would also like to thank you on a more personal note from my colleague, Mrs. Ristaka, and me. Uh, this call, uh, this phone call, Mr. Uh, Moskos, was a dream that became a reality, and we um, want to work with you very closely, and we look forward to that. Thank you. Oh, I thought you have to give it a uh, little goat. Kalispera oh. says, <laughs> on a health initiative team. Uh, and I'll be up here just momentarily to say a couple of words of introduction for our next session, which will focus on the link between mental health and child protection. Uh, so I'll say a couple of words about Mr. Kevin Dowling, who's here from the National Children's Alliance in the U.S. The National Children's Alliance is a national association and accrediting body for child advocacy centers across the U.S. Child advocacy centers provide integrated care and support for children who have been victims of child abuse. This includes creating a well-coordinated, safe, and child-friendly environment for them. And it also includes the provision of mental health care to the children and families that they serve. The National Children's Alliance provides support, advocacy, national leadership, as well as technical assistance to the child advocacy centers, of which there are almost a thousand across the United States, making it the largest network of care centers providing care for children who have been victims of abuse. They have recently undertaken to establish a new mental health institute whose goal is to provide more opportunities for professional training for the mental health professionals that work at these care centers. This will include a five-year strategy to roll out more evidence-based, trauma-informed training opportunities for these mental health professionals. Linking it with our discussion today, the newest grant under the SNF Health Initiative is to support the rollout of one of these training programs with the National Children's Alliance. And here today to speak a little bit more about this is Mr. Kevin Dowling, who has worked with the National Children's Alliance for more than two decades, including as the executive director of one of the children's advocacy centers in Portland, Oregon, for two decades. Today he works as the director of strategic initiatives and development for the National Children's Alliance. So with that, I'll turn it over to Kevin, and thank you again for your attention. Thank you. I'm, I think I pressed this. Oh, can you guys see that up there? Yeah. Perfect. I'm not seeing it down here, and that's why. Thank you. Um, I, at National Children's Alliance, we believe that every child has a right to heal. 
And we think that the best way to accomplish that is by working together. And that's why, from the bottom of my heart, um, I'm so happy to be here with you today. And why I want to thank Stavros Niarchos Foundation for inviting me, and um, Danai and Dimitra and Eliana for helping with all the details to get me from the western United States where I live here to Athens um, just in the last uh, few weeks. The main reason that National Children's Alliance is, exists is because child abuse, unfortunately, is really common. I know this won't, these numbers won't surprise anybody in this room, but in the United States, the last year that we have um, national data from um, Child Protective Services, there were 3.9 million referrals, about 7 million children, over 600,000 victims of child abuse, and about five children in the United States die every day um, from, from child abuse and neglect. These numbers, even though I've been in this field for about 28 years now, um, it's still uh, it's hard to believe that each one of these represents a child because one child being abused is too many. Um, I think that also these numbers don't reflect just how common child abuse really is. It, these are only the cases that have been reported to Child Protective Services. And so I think generally in our country, people will say that one in 10 children, for example, have been sexually abused by the time they get to be 18. Sex abuse isn't the most common form of child abuse. Neglect is, followed by physical abuse and then sexual abuse. And so I think with numbers like that, we can be pretty sure that we all know somebody that's been impacted by child abuse, whether they've ever told you about it or not. So National Children's Alliance exists um, to provide a coordinated, comprehensive response when somebody's worried that a child's been abused in communities all across the United States. Um, one of the main goals is to minimize trauma to children by bringing all the professionals in a community that respond to child abuse together under one roof to help with that response. So part of National Children's Alliance role across the country is as a membership organization. We have 939 member children's advocacy centers. They, are, they can be nonprofits, most of them are. Some are government-based. Some, like the one I worked in for 26 years, was hospital-based. There's 50 state chapters that are members of the National Children's Alliance, and those children's advocacy centers serve almost 400,000 children every year. So one function of National Children's Alliance is the membership part. The other part is accreditation. So we set standards that in order to be a member of National Children's Alliance, you have to meet those standards. And, and they range from having, uh, making sure that your community has a multidisciplinary team that consists of police officers, child protective services, school personnel, mental health, medical providers, that you have the people that are gonna be responding to child abuse in that community together following an agreed upon set of protocols in terms of what everybody's role is and what that response looks like. Other um, areas of accreditation include making sure that the facility is child friendly. Also related to what you all have been talking about today is um, mental health providers. There is one of the accreditation standards is around mental health, saying that in order to provide mental health treatment at a children's advocacy center, you have to have a master's degree. Um, you have to have a certain number of training every year. Those mental health providers, according to our accreditation standards, have to be involved in the case management and in um, any case conversations that are happening with law enforcement or child protective services to help inform kind of that response. The, um, I thought I could show you more slides about National Children's Alliance, but honestly, I thought maybe the best way to describe what we do is to tell you about one child that was seen at the Children's Advocacy Center where I worked, and um, I'll never forget this child. I'll call him Thomas, but I'll never forget him because he was really one of the um, kids that taught me just how important mental health treatment is for children who have experienced trauma. So Thomas uh, was about eight years old in the third grade, and he lived with his mother. And um, he was angry. <laughs> he was angry at school. He wasn't doing well in class. He was getting in fights with his peers. He was um, losing friends. He was angry at home. 
and fighting with his mom. And one thing people didn't realize is that for the past year, he was also being sexually abused by an adult relative that had moved into the home. He never told anybody about it. Um, not until that relative moved out, and then he told his mom, and she acted right away to protect and care for him. She called their family doctor, who referred Thomas to our Children's Advocacy Center. Thomas came to our Children's Advocacy Center the next day, and imagine, it, for the Children's Advocacy Center I worked at, it was a department in a children's hospital, and there were over 60 staff that worked there. So imagine this stage feel, filled with doctors, nurse practitioners, medical assistants, mental health providers, um, social workers, victim advocates. We had a detective stationed at our Children's Advocacy Center. We had somebody from Child Protective Services stationed at our Children's Advocacy Center. So that when Tom and his mom come to our Children's Advocacy Center, all those professionals are going to have to deal with her in one place. They're not having to go from place to place to place to place. And that's part of our effort to minimize trauma to children. So when Thomas comes to the center, he has a head-to-toe checkup by a medical provider to make sure that his body's healthy. He has a forensic interview by somebody trained to talk to children about what happened. And during that forensic interview, the police officer, child protective service worker, and medical provider are able to listen in to what Thomas says so he doesn't have to repeat that over and over and over. And in the course of that, that initial assessment, he makes really clear disclosures about abuse. So clear, in fact, that um, the offender gets arrested, goes to jail, and pleads guilty. And so on one hand, you think, great job. The criminal justice system worked really well for Thomas. Protected him from that offender, protected other children from that offender. But the question was, what about Thomas? He's still angry. He was still struggling with normal symptoms of trauma. And so he was referred to um, trauma-focused therapy at our center. In the course of therapy, Thomas talked about how he felt weak because he hadn't told about the abuse that was happening that had been going on for a year. And he thought his mother knew what was going on and never protected him. And the reason he thought that is because every once in a while, his mom would ask him, is anybody messing with you? And he would lie and say no. But he thought her just asking that question meant that she knew, that she really knew. And in the course of therapy, he was able to talk to his therapist about how his offender had threatened to kill him and his mom if he ever told. And in talking to his therapist, able to understand that not telling was actually a really strong, brave thing to do in a horrific situation. He was able, also able to um, have an understanding from his mom that she was asking that question because that's what her mom always asked her. She thought that's what a good mom did. She didn't know he was being abused. And as soon as she found out, she took action to protect him. And I think, I imagine Thomas growing up, if he didn't get that support and that treatment early on, thinking that he was weak when really he was strong thinking that the person most responsible for taking care of him didn't. And would it be a surprise that he might turn to drugs or alcohol to numb those thoughts and feelings, or turn to violence to feel strong again, or to have trouble trusting others and having meaningful relationships? That's the opportunity we have by providing that trauma-focused therapy early on in a child's life. We have an opportunity not just to improve Thomas's childhood, but the adult he's going to grow into, and community that, that we live in. The challenge for us at National Children's Alliance is not every child has access to that type of mental health treatment that Thomas did. Our latest survey of, um, showed that of the 400,000 children that are seen at Children's Advocacy Centers, about 285,000 are referred for trauma therapy, but about 80,000 don't get it. And the main reasons for that have to do with lack of engagement. So caregivers that don't trust our system, um, caregivers that don't understand how mental health treatment could help their child, caregivers that are understandably concerned about the stigma that goes along with that mental health treatment, as you all were talking about earlier today. The other problem is there's a lack of therapists trained to provide that specialized type of trauma therapy. And so 
National Children's Alliance, as a national organization, has been working to address that problem for a little over 10 years now, um, really starting with what we do at the local level, doing it at the national level, partnering with different funders and foundations. There's Cambia Health Foundation. They're an insurance company. Hearst Foundation is on there, and training partners, um, such as the Yale Child Study Center or the National Child Traumatic Stress Network. You can also see on there Staros and Yarkos Foundation. They're our newest partner, and they're really instrumental in helping us take these efforts from the past 10, 11 years and, and bringing them to scale, and I'll talk about that in just a second. The progress that we made over those years can be seen in the Thriving Kids Report from 2019. If you went to National Children's Alliance's website, you'd see that there. And, and you can really see, I, with the limited time we have, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, but what you see is there were more children's advocacy centers that were able to provide that type of mental health treatment to children. So th there was progress being made, and there were more therapists trained, and, and we were able to establish these partnerships with learning institutions or some of the developers of those trauma-focused therapies. And about six months ago, we established the Mental Health Institute. One of the reasons is, is that as a Children's Advocacy Center director, I didn't know where to send my therapist for training. There's not one place in the United States to send your therapist to learn about trauma-focused therapy or how to engage families in treatment. National Children's Alliance really seemed like a logical convener and central place where Children's Advocacy Centers could go for that type of training. There's different trainings that are parts of the National or the, the Mental Health Institute. Over the next five years, we're planning to train 5,000 professionals that by 2028 could be serving 80,000 up to 100,000 children a year trying to fill that gap. When we were thinking of what to approach Stavros and the Arcos Foundation with in terms of partnership and funding, the one therapy on here that really stood out to us was child and family traumatic stress intervention or CFTSI, and there's a lot of acronyms here, and so I, I, I will stick with CFTSI in referring to child and family traumatic stress intervention just to save some time. But that's the one we thought that would be best to kind of put forward first in partnership with Stavros Niokos. Some of the reasons that we chose that was that, um, one, it's one of our best opportunities to address that gap. We have a really good partnership with Yale Child Study Center who developed CFTSI. Um, they were really interested in providing that training in partnership with us. There was strong interest from children's advocacy centers in that type of training. Only 10% of children's advocacy centers were providing CFTSI, but over half were interested in getting that training, and you could see why. CFTSI is a short-term therapy, five to eight sessions, but the research is really strong. It's effective in reducing children's trauma symptoms. It's effective in, in even reducing trauma symptoms for the caregivers, and that, that was another thing that was really important, is it involves the caregiver in the treatment. One of the helpful things or parts of that involvement is making sure that the child and caregiver are on the same page regarding those trauma symptoms and what triggers those trauma symptoms. I remember a young girl we saw who um, every Sunday her family would gather together for breakfast and they'd have pancakes and bacon and, and eggs and her uncle lived with them and she and her uncle especially loved the smell of bacon and, the, and having bacon for breakfast. At some point he assaulted her and um, and it wasn't until in therapy when she was talking about the different things that trigger those memories of that assault that it became clear that the smell of bacon wasn't a wonderful thing anymore. It reminded her of that horrible thing that had happened. And, and I imagine you know, a caregiver, a parent, or a grandparent who loves that child, wanting to support that child and help that child, making her favorite breakfast on that Sunday morning and not understanding why that little girl is just staring at the plate and doesn't seem to appreciate all the trouble she went through to make that bacon. One of the things that trauma therapy does is helps that parent or grandparent do a better job of caring for their child, which they want to do. It helps them get on the same page. In terms of implementation, 
this is a map of the United States, and all those little dots are where the children's advocacy centers are. Almost a thousand. And we really um, thought that using that network um, is the best way to access providers that will be interested in this training. With support from Stavros Niarcos Foundation, National Children's Alliance is going to work with Yale's um, Child Study Center to create a series of videos for caregivers and for providers on what is CFTSI and how it might help their child. Also, we plan to um, create a video about delivering CFTSI via telemental health. Our trainings that we're planning, 50% we plan to have in person each year, 50% online, virtual live trainings, and that's to increase access. And then those trainings are followed by 14 consultation calls from master trainers. The other really neat thing about being part of National Children's Alliance and having those members is that we're able to collect data on the number of children that were referred to treatment, the number of children who started treatment, the number of children who finished treatment, and their trauma symptoms. Did they actually decrease like we had hoped that they would? So that data is really important to help us and Yale work to continually improve and um, advance the training. Just in closing, when I was learning about Stavros Niarchos about nine months ago, I watched the History and Mission video. And there's a quote from Andreas Chukopoulos where he says, we have to come together to work together. When I saw that quote, um, it just spoke to my heart because that's what I love about this work. And to see um, an organization that shared that same value um, was just really inspiring. So I have to say, in addition to just the funding and thinking of more therapists trained, helping more kids, I'm really excited about the opportunity to partner with Stavros Niarchos Foundation and the work that you're doing here in Greece and to learn from you um, to help kids hopefully all across the world. The last thing to finish with, this is from a thank you note from a child that was seen at our Children's Advocacy Center. It says, thank you for a fun day here. Now first, remember, this child's being seen uh, because somebody's worried that he's been abused or she's been abused, and they're thanking us for a fun day at our Children's Advocacy Center. Say, you guys are very nice, and you guys are fun every day. And when I look at this, I love this because, one, it's so colorful, but two, it reminds me of just how resilient children are if they get the support that they need early on. And, and just the opportunity we have in this work to impact the health of a child, the health of the adult that they're going to be, and the health of all of our communities. So in the words of this wise child, I want to thank you all for a fun day here. It's truly been an honor. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kevin, for just traveling an easy 8,000 miles to be here with us today and uh, for that wonderful speech. We're really looking forward to finding ways to partner. Congratulations on the work that you're doing. Uh, I am thrilled to welcome our next presenters to the stage for our final session of the day uh, to talk about this, continue this conversation on this very important topic of the nexus between child and adolescent mental health and child protection. Everyone. My name is Lea Nathanasopoulou, scientific head of Medical Pedagogical Center and inpatient unit, General Hospital uh, Georgios Papanikolaou. I am uh, a psychologist myself. And uh, we, we host uh, a lot of uh, children uh, there trying uh, to help them. 
a lot of those children are victims of uh, uh, not only family problems, but society. So we have a unit, inpatient unit uh, for children and adolescents and uh, an outpatient clinic also, which is in the west part of the city of Thessaloniki. In the afternoon session, uh, talking about empowering professionals in supporting children in vulnerable conditions and conveying uh, uh, the expectations of uh, my colleagues and uh, our partners in uh, Nyarchos uh, Foundation uh, for their initiatives, because initiatives come from people addressing to people. So there we host uh, children and adolescents uh, that might uh, be part of families with no problems. Vasiliki, with vulnerability issues. I asked her a day, she talked to us about an important issue. Have you ever shared that with a friend? No, I cannot share that with my friend. If others know my problems and weaknesses, I become vulnerable. And of course, Vasiliki has some perceptions that are formed from uh, the society per se, or might have uh, some uh, background uh, experiences. But uh, generally speaking, she lives in an environment uh, that is not insufficient. By taking measures, we can help them, help her. But what about all these children that initially uh, raise the question of vulnerability without prioritizing uh, what about uh, children that suffer domestic violence, uh, children with parents with mental health uh, issues, what about the children uh, Uh, with drug addict parents, uh, unaccompanied uh, minors, refugee children uh, with a lot of traumas, and children that have to be removed from their families uh, to be hosted elsewhere. And of course, I won't uh, forget vulnerability conditions or a secondary abuse by the system per se, which is inexistent occasionally. So we have this secondary abuse, (coughs) disappointment where you expected to find a solution. So these are experiences of all of us uh, working with children and And we are part of this society. Nonetheless, we are more responsible. So what can we do to empower ourselves as uh, professionals (coughs) besides consuming uh, a lot of coffee and consuming vitamin C or getting uh, getting, uh, days off? So how can we avoid this burnout syndrome and be efficient and effective? So I will introduce uh, my colleagues, most of them uh, I know personally or not. Mr. Nikolaidis, psychiatrist, MD, MA, uh, MSc, PhD, Director, Department of Mental Health and Social Welfare, Center for the Study and Prevention of Child Abuse and uh, Neglect. (coughs) Mr. Nikolaidis, thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation to share uh, our experience in the Institute of Child Health. Uh, I am at a difficult position uh, because I don't truly know, shall I say, what we do now and try to answer 
some of these questions raise all try to uh, talk about the challenges of child protection. I will do both uh, and I'll try to keep this sensitive balance. First, I need to say that as a psychiatrist adult, for adults, experiencing this violence, uh, domestic violence for children, I uh, saw that uh, we haven't been prepared as professionals how practically uh, we can identify mental health issues when they derive from social uh, aspects of life. We didn't have any preparation or experience on that. Uh, and talking about a lot of, with a lot of professionals and friends, we didn't have any preparation about the abused, uh, abused women uh, with panic attacks, uh, no preparation about abused uh, children that are bullied at school uh, or at home. We didn't have any preparation about this field uh, that actually exists uh, uh, away from our eyes. And this is the first thing that we need uh, to bring in the light, uh, to have educational procedures that will open our minds and allow us to think outside the box. (coughs) Not to think that a mental uh, disorder is just an algorithm uh, that we can uh, tackle easily. The second thing is that I was impressed uh, by the difficulty uh, existing in the field of child protection in Greece. And it has to do with the weakness to have different services, our professionals working together from different scientific backgrounds and cooperate in such a way so as to have a cooperated action and a final results in the 19-year I service. In uh, this institute, I spent half of my time trying uh, to translate or interpret uh, the notes uh, from uh, prosecutors uh, to policemen, from doctors to prosecutors, etc. People uh, have difficulty in accepting other people's work and protocols of approach. That is why we need to have uh, common grounds in order for all of us to cooperate. The third thing I want to touch upon is, and it's not easy to get over it, is that if we have a lot of health issues, uh, physical health, mental, if we have a lot of problems uh, with uh, justice awarding in social protection and welfare, these uh, problems are huge. This uh, area, which is an autonomous field of public administration in uh, European states, in Europe, after the war, social protection is uh, an autonomous uh, field which discuss equally with all parts of the administration. In Greece, this is not the case. We have seven different uh, networks, incompatible among them, substaffed, uh, understaffed, uh, and uh, not with adequate uh, education. So we have seven different social services in the regions, municipalities, under the umbrella of uh, of the Ministry of Social Welfare, some legal entities, social workers appointed, and lately we had a different network 
we have outsourced it in NGOs to offer services uh, to uh, refugees and uh, children refugees. And this is a net which is not stable because there is no communication among the different services. That is the big challenge, how to coordinate all these uh, agencies. Uh, something else I want to add uh, is the following. If uh, you are not well organized, that uh, goes without saying that we will be understaffed and you won't do your job properly. It's not uh, by chance that in Greece, child protection, when a child should be removed by his or her family is quite uh, problematic. When we know that throughout Europe, and not EU exclusively, with the exception of Ukraine probably, that had uh, huge institutions in no European country, uh, we have institutions or uh, we have institutions uh, that are about to close. And now we talk about how to I- improve our institutions and uh, make them non-abusive. Uh, removing a child uh, from the family is permanent, uh, whereas in reality, from a European experience, we know that uh, institutions like uh, Fostering uh, foster parents uh, are uh, something uh, that uh, helps children and at the same time helps the families stand back on their feet and uh, receive uh, their children uh, back. So we use foster uh, parents now uh, with a different meaning in uh, Greece, uh, uh, like uh, the first step uh, for adoption. So we have a distort, uh, uh, distorted uh, uh, idea about certain things. We have uh, no plans for intervention in the families where children are removed. And uh, none of us, including myself, uh, are not aware of uh, the problems uh, that uh, might uh, uh, be uh, raised. We have uh, children now that are hosted in various uh, institutions, uh, some uh, better ones, some uh, worse. And uh, we see that there are 85% chances to be abused and uh, uh, 25% uh, chances to be sexually abused in these uh, facilities. We use so absolute uh, approaches in order to deal with multifaceted uh, problems. Children with uh, disabilities, for example, how many obstetricians uh, give uh, uh, proper information to parents that bring to life people with disabilities? How many of them tell them the truth that uh, there are diseases that will, uh, because of their uh, disease, they, uh, instead of helping parents uh, substantially, they guide them to place their child in an institution and forget about it, which is... uh, inhumane, to put it uh, this way. So these are uh, the main problems uh, we are faced with. And uh, in the Institutes of uh, Child uh, Health, we try to to bring a lot of innovations 
in mental health, we need, we want to bring progress according to the state of the art globally and not the sui generis. To the state of the art globally and not the sui generis approach of uh, personal uh, points of view, which actually prevails in political uh, discourse. Uh, in this framework, uh, we have carried out a lot of studies uh, talking about the uh, uh, children's abuse, uh, victimization of children. We have, uh, uh, ha we have uh, a protocol uh, for uh, professionals uh, in supporting children in vulnerable conditions. Uh, and uh, how to refer these children to various authorities. We have introduced a system of recording uh, abuse uh, cases. We have uh, given that uh, to the state, which does not uh, use it eventually. And the state says that it will create a record. Nonetheless, uh, we, it is ready by us for the state to use it. Uh, we have built other tools uh, for, uh, for primary health care, for uh, screening, uh, also screening instruments. Uh, with SCLE and ECA agencies, we have an original methodology for estimating risks when parents are deprived of their child because of certain abuse incidents on Monday. Uh, we will uh, present these tools in our conference at the disposal of uh, professionals, individual plans for children under social protection in order to understand if uh, it, uh, this child uh, is going uh, to is entitled uh, to a fostering uh, family a foster family family reunification a, a tool also on how we can transform our institutions hosting children in modern institutions promoting and protecting the the, the rights of uh, the children a tool based on our previous work about risk assessment and intervention in, in families deprived of their children because of abuse incidents. In order to have child protection promoted in Greece, we need to change the paradigm to move from an absolute, uh, uh, obsolete uh, paradigm prevailing back in the 60s and 70s. The paradigm back then was we are a good people protecting uh, abused children from bad parents. We need to change paradigm and go to another model saying that uh, Child protection is not uh, a philanthropist's uh, work. It is work of uh, professionals. And we help as professionals, not those who are good and don't need us, but those who have problems. We help them to uh, grow their uh, children. And if we could change this paradigm, we will be able to see things from a different point of view. Thank you very much. I think 
Τι θα σας πω εγώ που βρισκόμαστε όταν έχουμε παιδιά σε οικογένειες που βλέπουμε ότι υπάρχουν ελλείμματα ή ανεπάρκειες. If we were to promote uh, the removal of the child, something that we have seen, and especially for all of us working without supervision, without uh, support, this is uh, a very uh, big uh, discussion and topic uh, that we need to work on. Now, moving on to Mrs. Mircini Kazaku, a child protection officer from the Department of Child Protection of uh, UNICEF Greece. Mrs. Kazaku, thank you very much. Good afternoon. Let me say from my side and from the side of the organization, uh, let me thank you for inviting me here, for uh, being able to discuss about all the difficulties in the child protection system and uh, perhaps see what we can do in the future. Just a general comment because truly I've um, watched uh, the presentation of the program and the initiative, which is very, very promising, especially if uh, uh, it is uh, this continuous, um, we, we get a continuous support from the state because there is a great uh, deal of reform needed. So we need to have uh, community services that are of quality, that are well-staffed and that focus on prevention and addressing the problems. And if we don't have those, then uh, it's impossible to do anything. Also, I was thinking, since we are talking about empowering professionals, and I truly think that uh, maybe I repeat myself uh, just to make it even clearer, I think that having worked in different areas in this field, how can we characterize a professional? Uh, what can we say about people working in child protection? The, those people working there feel exhausted. Uh, they feel alone. Uh, they don't have any personal time. And of course, uh, all these professionals are very resilient. They're trying, uh, they're doing their best. And what I want to stress today, don't really have anything to do with professionals and their skills, but uh, more with the frame, uh, the context where they are called uh, to work uh, in. Of course, the child protection system has many gaps and um, problems that are have been uh, present for many, many years. And the reform, I think, is connected to a redesign of all the services because uh, those are fragmented. They are torn between different ministries uh, uh, with the different um, uh, care uh, levels. Uh, so I think that each of those uh, professionals is working and struggling from their own uh, field. And there's no cohesive, there's no cohesive narrative that should be related to mental health and the population so that they are trying to support. And I think that if we had a more common and cohesive narrative, perhaps perhaps we could reach this paradigm shift a little sooner. As we heard before, it is true that for these reasons as well, there is no interdisciplinary uh, cooperation. Each uh, is uh, looking at things from their own part. There are no cooperation protocols. We work it out along the way, sometimes better than others. It's important to know that there are no institutionalized uh, protocols, especially when we're talking about uh, child abuse and identifying the symptoms of uh, child abuse. And the way in which we work uh, in those services is not child-centered. We, I think we're always trying to work around the red tape or pass the blame. That does not mean that uh, professionals uh, are not responsible, but we truly see uh, children being victimized all over again. So there's something that we're not doing right. And this is why there's a lack of trust in those services and those structures that are already available. So uh, understaffed services with deficiencies uh, in personnel, uh, rotating personnel, people are coming in and out. There's no scientific supervision, something that should have been an organic part of uh, this service. And, of course, 
uh, people are overworked. And I think that is very important. The rotation and the, uh, the fact that they are burned out, uh, as we heard before, uh, relationships are the most important thing that we're trying to cultivate in order to do a good job. So if people are keep changing uh, their posts, it's uh, very difficult to create a quality relationship with the children and the families that we're trying to support. So the other thing is something that we recognize, and it's also a, a sort of a critique uh, on ourselves as well. Uh, it's very These initiatives are very promising. I said so from the beginning. And uh, this uh, guarantee for the child that uh, will uh, conclude in April 2023. And there needs to be a continuation here. Uh, this uh, sort of fragmentation has to be uh, left in the past. This initiative uh, will uh, will leave a lot behind it, um, a great deal of work in terms of uh, collaboration protocols, in terms of uh, procedures, and it is a great opportunity to adopt to in, uh, and create uh, the right uh, tools uh, uh, to help uh, the services that will also be created. And also, since we are talking about the problems uh, still, We are used uh, not ha- to not having uh, prevention in our services, and professionals are dealing with difficult cases. Uh, um, no one really knows uh, what to do. It's, it's like if you start from from scratch each time, and that is very difficult uh, uh, and very difficult to help professionals. Uh, allow children to stay with their families. So we need to focus on that part as well. And what do we do as UNICEF? Since uh, 2017, which was a response to the refugee uh, crisis, because the international office in Greece uh, was established in 2020, essentially, we have worked uh, a lot uh, and closely with different bodies and organizations. And I see many friends and colleagues from different institutions here before me. Uh, we have did, we did uh, training in terms of the refugee crisis with uh, scientific clinic and supervision, with guides that we issued for the professionals, for the workers. And uh, even though some of these tools have been used, I think there's a lot pending. And uh, these need to be institutionalized and uh, incorporated in a cohesive frame. And this is why reform is needed. And I think that our role... Uh, but rather that this is our role to help uh, the state uh, to this end. I don't want to bore you, so thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, perhaps uh, it's... Uh, It's our destiny here in this panel to talk about all these things that have tired us a lot, uh, that have uh, sometimes um, led us to say, okay, I've had enough. And it is important to share. And it is important uh, to talk about those initiatives uh, and those efforts that can bring uh, more personal uh, efforts uh, together. And in just a few seconds, I wanted to say... uh, Sometimes, uh, well, uh, about a case uh, that, uh, you know, really stuck with me. Uh, Some things uh, become part of your personal life rather than your professional. I had uh, worked uh, with a woman that had uh, lost her daughter and her uh, son-in-law because of uh, drug abuse. And she was left with three um, grandchildren that uh, two of them had special needs, uh, special requirements, uh, mental health problems, required special education. The kids were not removed from the family, uh, and we played a part in that. And at some point, when uh, the grandchildren uh, had become uh, adults, the woman would come to visit me, and at some point, uh, on a very personal note, I asked her, Let's call her Aphrodite, that uh, her name was 
something like that. So I asked her, uh, Miss Aphrodite, how did you manage all these years? And she told me, I did the law. I found a, a way. I made, I did everything that I believed that I should do. Uh, I tried to find a way to do everything that I believed I should do. So uh, that's uh, sort of stuck with me. Let's uh, move on to Mrs. Kuvelagi, who is uh, the CEO of the Home Project. Thank you, and a great thank you to the foundation for the support uh, it provides to the Home Project and this specific program, and thank you for the invitation. Someone uh, mentioned before the invisible children. We work with uh, invisible uh, invisible uh, children, children that are not seen by the uh, institutions, uh, with uh, unaccompanied minors, with children that are victims of abuse. We have about 2,600 uh, uh, unaccompanied minors right now in Greece. Uh, 1,700 of those are kept in uh, homes of uh, in shelters for long-term stay. And just to tie in my presentation with the previous uh, colleagues, uh, those shelters are not even uh, um, under the child protection uh, institution's umbrella. So we're not talking about child protection when we're talking about unaccompanied minors. Right now, in the foster care register, we only include children below the age of 12, and we are uh, working, struggling, working really hard to register them. So we're talking about children that fall um, in the cracks of the, between the cracks of the system. Uh, and we're talking about children that are uh, victims of violence, police violence, violence from the services such as the asylum services uh, where workers don't have the right training to deal with them. And we are also talking about children that are the victims of a policy that really does not want them here. It's as simple as that. We cannot talk about child protection when we're not talking about social inclusion. We cannot talk about child protection when children, um, when they turn 18, uh, they cease to exist. They have no support. So all these things, uh, are, it's inevitable that they impact children that have uh, undergone, that have experienced multiple trauma. They have uh, received trauma in the uh, country of origin, in the, the along the way in Turkey, in Greece, uh, because of the lack of home, of shelter, of abuse, and they are being traumatized by the way they are um, handled by the different services, not only the asylum service but the, the police. Uh, we have very common, uh, frequent uh, police violence incidents. And uh, another trauma comes from not being able to find a space in the education system. Uh, for us, it is a rule that all children go to school, but they go to school after a great struggle from our side, and then there's no one to welcome them there. There's no facilities or there are directors who do not want them there. So what we are trying to do in the home project is essentially to create every day, because that's uh, everyday work and everyday struggle, a frame for child protection where mental health is at the center of everything that we do. But it cannot be alone. It's uh, linked uh, to education. It's uh, linked to social support, uh, to legal support. Uh, to anything that a child may need uh, through a personalized uh, through personalized care through a personalized uh, psycho uh, pedagogical plan where each child is treated as a person uh, whether what they need is family unification or whether they need an asylum we are fighting also for the children, our children who turn 18, and for very vulnerable cases that you have may maybe you have heard, people that are really left uh, uh, to, to to fend them from, from themselves. We're trying to create an ecosystem of child protection that will help care for those children. Uh, their 
and mental health is a priority. We have uh, psychologists in all our shelters, our homes, and they are part of the operation of the home because uh, there are different sorts of taboos uh, in the children's cultures, uh, the different cultures. There is uh, children's psychiatric um, uh, monitoring, support, and the priority for us is also to care for the professionals that uh, work with the children through weekly supervising sessions uh, from external associates and continuing training. And we do all those things through the ecosystem that we have created, uh, but that should not be the case. And this is why it is very important Uh, initiatives like this uh, the, from uh, the foundation, initiatives uh, aimed at training uh, of healthcare professionals that work with uh, these children. And again, I want to thank you because you are shedding light on a population that is not lit from uh, anyone else. Uh, And many times, the professionals that work with uh, unaccompanied minors, not only in uh, the home project, but with other organizations, are really, really fighting to do their work. It's not just that they are exhausted because of the difficulties of their job. They are fighting against the system in order to be able to care for those children. We, for example, have a child that's uh, two years old, a boy, and we are fighting, struggling for the uh, last two months uh, to register him in the foster care register. Uh, we are being um, sent from uh, one office to the other. So you can understand the frustration of all the professionals that are working with these children. There's a sort of, um, a, they, they feel the vanity, you know, the, 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 how, how vain the whole thing is. And we're trying to overcome it. Sometimes, uh, many times, we are successful, and this is what drives us to continue to fight. But uh, really, uh, our struggle is very, very difficult. So yes, training is needed. It's a given. And through this training and through this discussion, that is another way to uh, add some pressure Uh, and make it make those institutional changes happen because child protection truly should uh, involve uh, should uh, concern all children irrespective of the color their religion their origins and this is what uh, one would expect from a european country this should be self evident uh, it should be a given so when we are talking about institutional violence It's in, interesting to see that for us, uh, the most difficult cases in terms of uh, psychiatric uh, approach are those cases that have also received uh, the greatest uh, degree of uh, institutional violence and have faced uh, more obstacles. And that's uh, interesting and important because we are talking about sometimes about very young children who are not aware of all those difficulties and uh, all those complexities. Also, another problem that I, I hope will change, and I'm sure it will change through this program as well, we, fee, uh, we see impasses, deadlocks uh, with very difficult psychiatric cases that need to be hospitalized. hospitalized. There are no beds available. I think we talked about that before. Uh, there are no beds available for Greek children either. And a lot of the times we have to operate as uh, uh, closed um, mental health facilities or some um, uh, rehabilitation or, well, um, or centers that uh, offer uh, services and, uh, that we cannot. We need to care for babies or for underage mothers, and we need to deal with uh, psychiatric uh, cases that are very difficult to handle. There are also uh, very problematic institutional uh, procedures, such as the involuntary hospitalization. For example, a severe psychiatric case when there needs to be hospitalization, Uh, we need to call the police. We need to work for a police car to arrive, maybe a few hours. The police car arrives, and then uh, there's uh, six to eight hours at the police station 
where many times the policeman might be violent uh, um, towards the child so that we can, in fact, take the order by the prosecutor to go uh, to the hospital, which means that the professional, the healthcare professional, has uh, spent uh, 12 or more hours and then in the end uh, goes back to the shelter uh, without uh, succeeding and then need they, they might need to repeat the whole thing uh, eight hours later. So we need to consider all these things and I know that the foundation has uh, taken them into account and we're very grateful for the support that the professionals receive because professionals need to receive this support and feel this support in order for them to be able to do their jobs and support those very vulnerable children. So hopefully through those initiatives it will be possible to make those children visible and to support uh, those who work uh, for them. Thank you. Thank you very much. The last uh, question about hospitalization, uh, which is a great uh, problem uh, for us, especially in the latest years, and especially for the unaccompanied minors, we are experiencing from our side because uh, the mental health care services from the public sector uh, truly deal with this. And we have been experiencing conditions and situations that appear traumatic to us, and uh, we cannot even imagine how traumatic it is uh, for those children. Children that uh, come alone, arrive alone, unaccompanied, and don't know who to turn to and what to ask for. And that's also another question about the continuing, I would say, uh, or ongoing education uh, in uh, psychiatric uh, help, which I think is uh, uh, completely uh, problematic right now. Also, a lot of the times, sort of a knee-jerk reaction here. It's like we consider those uh, refugee children as uh, one category, whereas they come from different races, they have different cultures, they have different history or stories uh, behind them. Anyway, there's a lot to talk about here. Now, moving on to Mrs. Alexandra Ligri a psychologist, the director of the Department of Human Resources at the uh, SOS Children's Villages. We've been cooperating for many years in Thessaloniki as well. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to be here with you today. Rather difficult, uh, just before the end of this uh, conference, I want to share uh, the SOS uh, uh, Children's Villages experience uh, and some uh, cooperations we have uh, had all these past years with child protection agencies. Uh, well, at the beginning, uh, two, thi two things about who we are. We are part of a bigger uh, network uh, part of uh, the SOS uh, Children's Villages International uh, Organization active in 136 uh, countries. Uh, we support uh, children in need. We help them in order to create their future and uh, in the end, uh, to become independent and not use us any longer. <coughs> and uh, we participate in the development of uh, communities in which these children belong uh, to. Uh, we have uh, two oh, pillars. Uh, we implement the programs in uh, various uh, country in various uh, uh, towns in Greece, and we have uh, programs uh, of uh, family integration, support centers for child and families 
and uh, centers of uh, learning uh, support. <laughs> we try to help these uh, children and the main uh, objective of our intervention is uh, to inform, uh, raise awareness uh, with regard to good practices of care and support and create new knowledge uh, in enhancing uh, and empowering uh, the healthcare professionals. Uh, the interventions are guided by the needs of the children and the legal framework in which we are invited to develop these interventions. How we do what we do? Methodology requires combining theory and practice. And I want you to bear that in mind. We work as a team. In this framework of a working team, an educational team, uh, education is based uh, in uh, interactive participation of the educators, in cooperative learning, uh, in the framework of an educational uh, team. We want all professionals to have uh, full knowledge of where they stand. They need to know their limitations and uh, rights. And of course, we also were also based in feedback and continuous education. Our uh, educational uh, uh, units uh, focus on various uh, things. I want to. I don't want to tire you. We don't have uh, ready recipes. Uh, we try to adjust to the needs of the people. We don't want to reinvent the wheel. The, but we need to know how we can operate this wheel properly under certain uh, conditions. Uh, so we have uh, education on three phases. The first is the initial one, basic ideas and skills in uh, child care. Then we have deeper knowledge uh, while a professional moves forward in its professional in his or her professional life and then we try to work with the knowledge and combine it with experience and the relationship developed with children in this uh, part we identify the difficulties deriving from the professional per se. And at this point, uh, always professionals ask uh, for more education. We have uh, case studies uh, and uh, group uh, education. What makes uh, both operations important is that it is good to stop and think what went right, to talk about it and why it went right, and uh, group education and supervision is an area where a professionals can talk in a team about their problems and be empowered by the team to continue working with children. Why a team? Why a group? We all know. We all know that adult relationships and how we manage them are reflected on children per se. Our thoughts is that participating in a team creates a collective sharing uh, mentality that actually uh, makes them stronger, 
before they, in their turn, help children become stronger. And now I will give you three examples of actions in cooperation with other child protection agencies that have to contribute to our discussions. The deinstitutionalization Uh, program started uh, in 2017 with the support uh, of Stavros Niarchos Foundation and then it was included in child quarantine cooperation with UNICEF and is implemented uh, in uh, regional uh, structures in uh, uh, four uh, regions. The, the aim of this program is to support the institutionalization, uh, giving uh, the children the opportunity to live in a family of different forms. I will talk about uh, a small uh, part of that. For the needs of our discussion, we covered six uh, cycles uh, of uh, meetings. Uh, the thematics uh, are uh, uh, Obvious, we talked about uh, trauma, uh, the institutional uh, uh, identity, the role of the caretaker, how to be adjusted and uh, cover the needs of the children. We discussed a lot about that. It is something uh, that uh, the professionals themselves are interested in how we can have a family reunification to the benefit of the child. The experience from uh, deinstitutionalization will uh, be concluded with uh, positive uh, experiences. The most important uh, message is that we have partnership between private and partner private and public sector. What we have achieved is to have mutual knowledge and uh, exchange of uh, know-how. Uh, we came closer. Uh, understanding of professionals increased and networking was promoted to the benefit of the beneficiaries in a various program professionals incorporated in their daily work the teamwork and since a lot of interventions were carried out during uh, the pandemic we found new ways of promoting education in this field. I would also like to present a program which was concluded recently. We had a cooperation there with Child Psychiatry Clinic of Thessaloniki. Uh, this uh, trauma sensitization, uh, trauma awareness uh, Uh, project. It is an educational program focusing on trauma and uh, uh, had to do with professionals, not only from our field, but from the field of justice or uh, social care. The aim of the program is to change our mentality about trauma, how we recognize it, manage it, and mainly how we can bring in our job practices updated about mental traumas. Something uh, that actually suits uh, uh, us best Co-op participation of young adults in uh, independent living. Young adults, young adults are below 25, contributed 
to this program and uh, they became co-educators in uh, various act- actions and their voice helped us bridge theory with uh, practice and actually helped us understand how children growing up in alternative care feel. That was to the benefit of all uh, professionals. These are uh, the guides produced by the program. This program concerned live uh, education, uh, internet education. Uh, live ones were participated by 500 uh, participants, and then we had uh, 1,000 uh, distant uh, learners. We had uh, workshops and recommendations at policy level, which I believe is very important. and. Uh, could uh, um, help uh, this kind of intervention become sustainable. Uh, Interventions uh, are important but should be accompanied by institutional changes. Uh, Recommendations concern three things. continuous training to the personnel on basic issues that have to do with uh, children growing up in alternative care frameworks. Uh, Deinstitutionalization is a one-way street and something that uh, concerns us all is how important it is uh, to have an interdisciplinary cooperation among all those involved in child care, something starting from the prosecutors, the schools, uh, social services, welfare services, etc. I will uh, close with uh, a program Uh, called Mental Health uh, Hub. It was carried out with uh, the partnership of the Secretariat General of Unaccompanied uh, Minors and uh, the assistance of uh, professionals working e- with children in uh, hostels. We have trained until now 800 uh, professionals. There is a training of trainers uh, program on the sustainability, empowering people working uh, in uh, this uh, framework uh, with the challenges uh, presented earlier by Sophia. The second uh, level of Mental Health Hub had to do with a systematic uh, supervisory framework in the 40 hostels participating in the program and the third one, which is the biggest challenge, and it is part of the discussion uh, we have with the ministry, how, in other words, these children growing up in hostels uh, Uh, can uh, have access uh, to culturally sensitive uh, mental health uh, <coughs> facilities. That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mrs. Lige. Uh, The one thing I want to say, because of uh, our long-term, many years of cooperation, I would say that among uh, the child protection uh, structures, I would say that you are the ones that truly follow up with the children until uh, they become adults or until they are rehabilitated with their families or until they they stand on their feet, and I think that's important. I think we also have six minutes for a discussion for a Q&A. Maybe there are questions, maybe from the audience here in the room, maybe online.
Well, good afternoon. My name is Aristides Lorenzos. I come from the AMG Evolution of Life, uh, Development of Life. So we are very happy for all these meetings. And we want to thank you. Uh, I've worked uh, with uh, the other people on the panel, Mr. Kazakis, Mr. Uh, Ms. Kazaku, Mr. Nikolaitis, Mrs. Ligri. We are active in uh, child protection. We collaborate with uh, close the structures uh, for the care of adolescents and young adults. We uh, have approximately 100 uh, people, uh, young people that uh, uh, we home and about 25 that have left our structures and we're trying to support them in finding their steps uh, in life. So, These actions, these initiatives are very important for us to continue the dialogue with this uh, vulnerable and sensitive population. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. My name is Evdokia Bakalo. I come from the Special Secretary of the Protection of Unaccompanied Minors from the Ministry of Immigration and Asylum. I want to talk about the health hub programs uh, with uh, and uh, talk about thank you for the initiative um, and want to convey the feedback that we received from the professionals that have uh, already participated in the program in terms of the clinical supervision and the training. We have very positive feedback from the professionals and a great deal of a great response. Uh, the goal is uh, to empower them, to continue to train the professionals, to decompress them, help them decompress in the context that they work along with children so that we can have an overall holistic approach in uh, line with the national policy that we follow for the protection of children. And especially, especially for empowering professionals, we believe that professionals should have the right tools and assets in order for them to do the job and uh, actually support the children. And again, thank you, and thank you for the excellent cooperation with the children's SOS villages. A question for Mr. Nicolaidis from the internet. We heard Mr. Nicolaidis about the difficulties in coordinating uh, different professionals in the disciplinary cooperation, something that is very important when we are dealing with uh, children and uh, adolescents with mental problems. How easy is to achieve this sort of interdisciplinary cooperation and how can we make things better? What is your experience in this regard, good or bad practices? And another question, how can we professionals within this uh, problematic frame, uh, as you said, Mr. Uh, Nicolaitis, how can we play our part in the right way? How can we effectively support uh, children, families, and children without families? How can we be empowered? Just a simple, simple answer, yes. I don't know if I can answer that in one uh, minute and 52 seconds. Uh, anyway, it's not something that I cannot answer about. I should not answer about the bad practices. I could speak uh, for hours about that, but I can answer in terms of the good practices. All these progl- problems and challenges for the system, from our side at least, uh, if they are highlighted, it's not because uh, we want to say, okay, this is the case and we cannot do anything about it. It is to say that even today, with this fragmented uh, legal and institutional framework, there is a way There is a way for us to uh, come together, uh, join forces, and uh, create the necessary momentum for the system to change. We can adopt protocols and ways. And, of course, uh, we don't need to reinvent uh, the wheel here. For most of the things that we talked about, there is accumulated international knowledge and good practices for risk assessment, for how to intervene, for uh, positive social rehabilitation. There is positive uh, feedback on that. There is experiences about uh, cold cases and uh, hot cases treatment. We do have uh, information on that. For forensic examination of uh, children witnesses and for all other uh, aspects. 
what I mean to say is that there's a lot that we can use, that we can bring from abroad and uh, adopt them, implement them in Greece. And this is what we're trying to do. We are trying to tie in uh, everything. Uh, we can uh, want to give uh, those good practices to the people so they can start using them. But also, we want people to continue to press so that these changes become uh, uh, the institution. Uh, they need to be adopted by decision makers so that it's not just a matter of uh, a few professionals uh, adopting uh, those techniques. Uh, and the other questions uh, are truly about that we are not able to ask right now are again uh, on uh, the same uh, topic what we can do on an institutional level uh, because uh, everyone wants to do things everyone wants to see things change and I think we need to wrap up our session thank you all for uh, your attention And I'd like to invite to close us out today Panos Papoulias, Chief Operating Officer of SNF. With us today for these very interesting discussions, I will uh, take the opportunity to answer a question that was posed from the audience and from Mrs. Kazaku as well. How can all these efforts uh, truly help people through the public sector, families, uh, patients that don't have the financial means to access services and uh, mental health care services? The answer lies in the fact that within a few days, There's going to be a legislation adopted and that uh, will uh, provision for this and for including the operation of the hubs that we talked about throughout the system, uh, throughout the day in the healthcare system. Of course, it's not an answer for everything. It's not a cure-all for every issue that was raised today, but it is a sign that uh, the state is committed Um, towards this goal and as Mr. Themistokleos uh, talked about in the morning uh, in our initial discussion everything uh, is uh, all these are things that the Greek state has already agreed uh, to adopt and uh, proceed on with all the bodies and organizations that are uh, working uh, in this field. We are very happy to have the president uh, of uh, the foundation Mr. Drakopoulos from uh, New York And as uh, we heard in our initial uh, discussion, it was uh, his um, words that uh, really became the trigger uh, for everything that we have discussing today. Mr. Drakopoulos. Good morning. Th- uh, good afternoon. Thank you very much uh, to everyone who's there, uh, either online or in the room. The main thing for us, I would say, is uh, what our ancestors would say, uh, you have to have a healthy mind, uh, a healthy body in a healthy mind. And uh, what happened in the last uh, decades, uh, people were paying too much attention on their bodies, their corpse, and uh, neglected uh, everything that had to do with mental health. And if there's one thing good coming out of COVID is the fact that it brought the matter of uh, mental health to the surface. And now uh, everyone, every family, every house has uh, more awareness on that. So in this frame, we started this initiative uh, that started from Greece, but it became a a global uh, project. And the more we continue, the more we progress, we felt the need to focus our attention on the matter of health, of mental health, not because Uh, we are specialists on that, but because we understand that it is something that will accompany us in the decades to come, and it doesn't concern just the young people, it concerns all of us. We are in a position to help, uh, we are able to help, and we are able to bring different organizations together and start something that I believe is just at the beginning. The first thing was to remove the stigma, that's the good thing that uh, COVID brought. And I will continue in English because uh, we've done a lot of work uh, with different organizations in English. 
today. Θέλω uh, λοιπόν να σας ευχαριστήσω. In person or, or virtually. I said that the, there's an ancient Greek saying, νους υγιής and σώματι υγιές, which basically means healthy mind in healthy body. The focus has been almost forever on the healthy body. We do all these things for our, for our physical health and, and our bodies. We try to. And we left behind the mind. I think we left behind the mind because we took it for granted. We took it for granted that it's always going to be there. Well, the mind has been crying out for help. And I think COVID, if it did one good thing, it had a lot of a, a lot of bad things, of course, that came out of it. But one good thing is that the stigma came off mental health. People wouldn't even talk about it. Forget about the, the old days when if you had an issue, it was either get on with it or the other extreme, uh, you had to get medication. The, there's a big uh, there's a big spectrum in between and i think this is the beginning of a global effort by many and uh, we are at the beginning of this journey collaborations are needed at every level and that's why in, in greece i want to thank also mr Demistocleos and everybody at the health ministry i think they have realized also the importance of the subject and we are very happy to collaborate with them uh, within the scope of the of the health initiative in Greece, and also to thank our our global collaborators, uh, and first uh, Dr. Harold Koplevich, who we have become also personal friends, more important than anything else. But the collaboration that we have had for more than 25 years in in many different aspects, and how it has evolved and became this this special project uh, that CMI accepted to come and help us in Greece, help us share their experience, their knowledge, and, uh, and, uh, and, and help us be able to, to offer the services in Greece via the hospitals, via these this five centers. Also with CMI, we're doing the, the Global Center for Child and Adolescent Mental Health at the CMI in New York. Uh, I want to thank also Columbia University uh, for the SNF Center for Precision Psychiatry and Mental Health, which basically will catalyze the use of precision medicine based in genomics in the di diagnosis, prevention, and treatment of psychiatric disorders to improve individual outcomes and the overall standard of, of the care. It's all about access to quality health care, whether it's for the body or for the mind. And I know that uh, it's an issue again because of, of COVID. Everybody talks about it. I think access to good health should be a given. And uh, I don't think it has to do with politics, with anything else. It, it should be a given. We're all human beings. Every human being should have access to quality care. And especially nowadays to, you know, to mental care, to mental health care. So thank you to everybody at CMI. We've had an amazing collaboration more things to come. And as we build this uh, this uh, network of collaborations, both in Greece and globally, and uh, we thank you for coming today. And we will look forward to, to seeing you in June at the Nostos conference, June 22nd, 23rd, where a lot more will be shared. And again, hopefully this is the, the beginning of a journey, but I think building awareness and being able to talk freely about it is the most important thing for all of us to do. So thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Drakopoulos, and thank you all very much for being here with us today.